Hello everybody again. Uh, this is the first type of investment we look at in our course. Uh, actually, we have two types of investment we look at. The first one is the valuation of common stocks and the second one, the valuation of bonds. Um, we're looking at it, each one of them separately. We begin with the common stock valuation. Uh, actually, this topic is a little bit long topic because the investment in common stocks is very common all over the world. And uh, it's quite interesting topic uh, because we hear about it in our everyday life and uh, we have um, many surprises regarding the common stock valuation. Uh, on the other hand, we do not have such surprises in the bond valuation, so we can say the common stock valuation in reality uh, is a little bit uh, complicated than the, the bonds valuation. And this is what you're going to realize by the end of this topic. Uh, it requires a lot of readings, uh, a lot of knowledge regarding uh, the company, the nature of company itself, the industry where the company is working and the macroeconomic condition where the country where the company is located i mean the country where the company is located uh, you are going to learn a lot of experience out of uh, this one uh, but uh, let me take it uh, step by step again in the beginning we have uh, certain objectives to achieve by the end of this uh, topic uh, we need to begin with the first valuation model ever existed in the literature of finance, which is a dividend uh, discount model. Uh, and then it was followed by other uh, models, residual income and the free cash flow. And then we'll be looking at the price uh, ratio analysis. Uh, before we begin, the three uh, approaches, I'm calling them maybe methods or approaches, are quite different from each other, so they are not alternative to each other. Uh, each one of them is completely independent from the other one, and each one of them works out under certain conditions. Uh, we're going to look at the component of each method and the requirement for each one, and then we discuss the result of, of each one of them. Uh, the methods are grouped into uh, four groups, as you see here, the dividend discount model, residual income, free cash flow, and the last one, the price ratio models. And uh, I'll be delivering you each one of them in a separate file because they are uh, in terms of recording and uh, the, the size of the file is, is huge. So I'm, I'm dividing it the entire topic into uh, four parts, uh, be looking at the first one, how we use the dividend discount model for the stock valuation. Uh, first of all, the, the use of four of them is what we call it, generally speaking, the fundamental analysis. By fundamental, I mean we are using certain information about the company uh, and certain information about the industry. This is what we mean by fundamentals in order to provide uh, a security analysis or a stock valuation. Um, and this is very different from what we call a technical analysis. The technical analysis refers to the tracing the value of the stock, actually the, the price of the stock, tracing the, the price of the stock um, in a very short term basis, doesn't exceed more than a week five days maximum, but the fundamental analysis is much deeper, much insightful, it requires a lot of statistical analysis, and I said in the beginning, it requires a lot of knowledge about the company, the industry, where it is, where it belongs, and uh, where it is located. Uh, but the first model, as the uh, name tells us, a different discount model, it, uh, it requires that the stock analyst has to 
acquire some information about the dividend. Uh, and all what we do is that we discount the expected dividend and we discount as well the expected price. Uh, the, the model is quite simple um, and now it has become simple because it's built in in Excel. I'm just showing you here the equation if we have uh, this is a very usual equation of uh, present value uh, in terms of uh, the stock valuation uh, the present value is the same as the price of the stock and p0 refers to the current price and by the current price again i mean the real value of the stock and this is uh, very different to uh, uh, to discuss because uh, the the value of the stock is very different from the price of the stock uh, but the value refers to whether the stock is overvalued or undervalued but the price of a stock is uh, is a matter of calculation we use an equation in order to end up with the price of the stock and this is what makes a difference between the value of the stock and the price of the stock. Uh, we observe prices on the on any uh, stock trading screen, and these prices are actually observed prices. But in order to convert the price into value, you just need to compare between the price you look at in the screen, the published prices, like on the daily trading screen, the stock market, and the real price of the stock. If the stock is trading on the screen at a price greater than what you calculated using this equation, so we call it the price, the, the stock is uh, uh, undervalued uh, because the people are trading a stock at higher value, otherwise it is uh, overvalued. Uh, so the, the equation, as I said, is quite simple. Uh, all what we need to do is to discount the dividends plus the expected price. Uh, let me show you how it works uh, through a very simple example. So assume that uh, we have, for example, one investor uh, where he received some information that the company would be paying dividends uh, 2.4 for the next uh, four years. And the investor is using a risk adjusted discount rate uh, 10% and the investor is expecting the selling price to be uh, 40 which means that the investor received an information that the company will not change the amount of dividend which is 2.4 for the next four years and the four years is the investment horizon of the investor i mean the investor might be planning to keep the stock for the next four years and the investor is expecting the price which is this one uh, to be sold at 40. so we have here two types of uh, i would say uh, estimations the amount of dividend actually is not estimated by the investor it's estimated by the company and the company broadcasts the amount of investment the amount of dividends to the investor but uh, the expected selling price uh, is to do with the investor the investor is expecting to sell the, the stock after four years uh, at 40. so uh, the expectation of dividends is broadcasted by the company but, but the expectations about the price uh, as the uh, investors doing. Uh, so if you worked out manually, uh, it takes this form that we divide the dividend by one plus the discount rate for the next four years. Uh, by the end of the fourth year, uh, the investor is, is expected to sell the price at 40. Uh, uh, this price has to be discounted as well and we end up with the, the price of the stock. This is what we call it the real value of the stock. In, in other language, uh, we call it intrinsic language, uh, sorry, intrinsic uh, value of the stock uh, or theoretical value of the stock. The most common term used is the real value or the real 
price of the stock. Uh, we have certain uh, notes here before we move on. Uh, the, the first one is that we can tell whether this stock is overvalued or undervalued. Again, if we compare between this price and the trading price uh, in the stock market, if the people are trading this stock at, let's say, uh, 40, 40 dollars instead of 34, so we would say that this stock is overvalued. I mean, the investors in the stock market are overstating the value of the stock. But actually, the value is much less. And the otherwise is uh, it's true if the people are trading this stock at 30, for example, we would say that this stock is undervalued. The second note, which is really a uh, very uh, important one, and we're going to re re realize how important it is later on, uh, when it comes to the determination of what we call it the appropriate risk adjusted discount rate, which is 10%. Actually, this is the link between this topic and the previous topic where we uh, discussed many forms of interest rates. So the question here, but I'm quite sure that you have the answer about it, how the investor determines the risk adjusted discount rate. Because in the last topic, we reviewed many types of interest rates and uh, this is the main reason that uh, we are still calling K up to this minute uh, every single course in finance uh, a required uh, rate of return or a required discount rate because this interest rate varies from one investor to another one investor might be willing to use a risk-free rate of return offered in the money market another one might be willing to use another rate like um, the interest rate on a bank deposit or another rate of uh, rate of return on real estate, for example. Uh, but anyhow, we commonly refer to the discount rate as the required rate of return. But I um, emphasize again that uh, this is the main reason that we had discussed the uh, all surrounding types of interest rates before we go on to this one because after a while you would realize how sensitive the value of the stock which is this one to the interest rate that the investor uses now if you proceed uh, uh, if you go to the uh, theory excel file we have this data uh, been given about one company that the the company has announced uh, the dividend for 40 years, 2.4, and the investor is expecting to sell the, the stock at 40 after 40 years and the discount rate, or as we just called it, the required rate of return is 10%, so we end up with 34. Actually, uh, as I said, uh, uh, we can do that very easily in Excel because uh, this value, uh, just the present value, of the uh, four dividend plus the price, and it takes this four. When you go to Excel, and you highlight this cell, uh, it's uh, simply equal to the MPV, but uh, we have a note here regarding the use of MPV in Excel. Actually, when you type equal to MPV, it calculates the present value, not the net present value. And uh, as you see here from the windows, it's quite simple. When you type MPV, it shows you this is screen, the rate is a discount rate, and uh, you just need to enter the values of dividends for the next four years, except for the last one, the fourth year, the investor will be receiving two amounts of money. The first one is a dividend, and the second one, the expected price, the investor is expecting to sell the stock at. So when you click OK, you end up with the same, uh, the same answer, and here is it. Uh, we have certain exceptions, I would say, regarding the dividend discount model. 
The first exception is to do with what we call it constant growth rate. In the previous example, we'll, we have been using a certain uh, amount of dividend. Actually, the, uh, the growth rate in the previous example was zero because the, the company was not willing to change the amount of dividend for the next four years. But if it happens that we have a growth rate of dividends and this growth rate would not change, and that's why we call it constant, we can replace the previous model with this one, this one. Um, in this model, uh, we realize that we have a new variable, which is the G. The G here is refers to the growth rate. Actually, it's a historical growth rate of, uh, of dividends. Uh, let me take an example to, to show you how it works. Uh, assume, for example, that the amount of dividend, current dividend is $10, and we have a dividend growth rate. Again, it's a historical growth rate. The investor has to estimate this one by, him, by himself. And uh, the investor is expecting uh, a long-term investment horizon. It says here there will be 20 yearly dividends. Uh, I mean, the investor has a long-term investment plan. The investor is not willing to give up this stock for the next 20 years. Again, it's a matter of expectations. And the appropriate discount rate is 10%, uh, 8%. By the term appropriate, this is what I just referred to as a required rate of return. So the appropriate here means appropriate to the investor. If you work out this equation, uh, it's a manual equation, you end up with, uh, with this price. But again, in Excel, it looks like uh, you have certain givens here, and then when you work it out with the, with the equation, you end up with the same price. We have certain, uh, again, uh, uh, surroundings regarding, surroundings or requirements regarding the use of this equation. The first one is that uh, this equation is quite, uh, useful to some extent under certain condition. The first one is the growth rate, G, has to be uh, uh, less than the discount rate, which is key. Uh, the third condition, uh, sometimes we look at the constant perpetual growth model. It's not the constant growth model, like what we did in the previous example, it's a perpetual. By perpetual, I mean forever, but actually it's a metaphor. I mean, we don't have one investor who is willing to uh, hold the stock or to make an investment on a stock forever. The, as I said, the forever is a, is a proxy, it's a metaphor. It means that the investor doesn't have an investment horizon. The investor assumes, uh, for example, that he would keeping this uh, a stock until something happens and maybe he decides uh, to sell the stock later on. So if we do not have investment horizon, so we do not have T, the T is a time. So the, the previous model doesn't work out. It is replaced with uh, this model where we don't have T, as you real, realize here. The D0 refers to the current dividend. The G again is the growth rate of dividend and K is the required rate of return. Uh, here we have a real life example about one company listed in, uh, in the stock market. Uh, so the information you have here is real life information. Uh, we assume in 2012, the company paid uh, dividends 2.35 to the investor per stock. So the current dividend is 2.35, and at that uh, time, the uh, K, which is the required rate of return, was uh, 4.75, and this is to do with the discount rate set by the Federal Reserve at this time, and the investor calculated the growth rate of dividend at 2%. Now, if you work out this equation, you end up with a price 87.16. Now we can determine whether the stock is overvalued or undervalued. 
uh, at that time, at the mid-2012, the stock was trading in the stock market at 57.34, less than your estimated price, which means that this stock actually uh, is overvalued. The investors have been trading the stock at a price greater, uh, sorry, uh, the stock is undervalued, forgive me. The stock is undervalued. The investors have been trading the stock at a price less than its real value. What we calculate here is the real value of the stock, but uh, this is the price of the stock as listed in the stock market. Uh, if you look at initially at the possible explanation for this difference, you just need to look at the components. I mean, we have one, two, or three components in the equation, so the, one of them must be responsible for the difference between the trading price and the read price. I mean, why the stock is undervalued? Uh, definitely, it's not to do with the uh, the growth rate. The growth rate is historical, uh, and the appropriate discount rate is determined by the Fed. But uh, it's highly likely that this stock is uh, undervalued because of uh, the amount of dividend. I mean, uh, uh, the company, uh, if the company had paid a lower amount of, my, of dividends, uh, the price could have reached the market price. So the company is a little bit uh, paying uh, higher dividend than the competitors in the, in the industry. Uh, this is the solution again uh, for the same company using Excel. As I said, it's a, a manual calculation. Now we come to uh, uh, another uh, point. Uh, it's an extension to what we said in the uh, previous model, that we have three components. The first one is the current dividend, the second one is the growth rate of dividend, and the third one is the discount rate. As I said, the amount of current dividend is determined by the company, so the investor has nothing to do with it, and the investors are not able to change it in the short term. The growth rate of dividend is historical, uh, can be estimated by the investor, but uh, we have an issue regarding the discount rate. What is the appropriate discount rate? In the previous example, we have used the published discount rate by the Federal Reserve, but uh, uh, maybe this is not the appropriate discount rate. Now, we move to one of the methods that have been uh, developed, offered by William Sharp in 1964. At that time, he called it the Capital Asset Pricing Model, CAPM. We use it simply for determining the discount rate. And in corporate finance, is commonly referred to as uh, risk-adjusted required rate of return on equity. It is divided into two parts. The first one is the risk-free rate of return as determined by the Federal Reserve. Uh, and since we are looking at the short term, we can look at the risk-free rate of return on Treasury bill plus uh, what we call it risk premium, and the risk premium equal to the stock beta times the stock market risk premium. Again, uh, let me break down the terms here. The, the deeper rate uh, is the return on 90-day U.S. Treasury bill, which is very common. This is uh, quite convenient for making for the stock valuation uh, in the short term. The stock beta is a statistical term. Uh, luckily speaking, it's built in in Excel, and it is defined shortly as uh, the riskiness of the stock relative to the uh, riskiness of uh, the index. The stock market risk premium, which is this one, is the difference between the return on the market index and the risk-free rate of return. 
let me show it to you how it works in the next example. I'm just showing you where I obtained the data because as I said, this is a real life data. Uh, this is a company and the company is listed in the NICE, New York Stock Exchange. And I downloaded uh, certain data. The stock price since April 2009 up to February 2011 and the values of uh, the index. So we have stock prices or and what we call it the index prices. And I did download from the Federal Reserve as well the uh, United States uh, three months is bond yield, which is the short term during uh, the same time. So at about mid 2012, that was the discount uh, rate used by the Fed. Uh, the first step is to calculate beta, and as I said, is built in in Excel. Since we have data about the stock price and the index price, the first step is to convert the prices into return using the LIN, um, uh, LIN of the current price divided by the previous price. This is what we did in previous lectures. Uh, so when you have the return for the company, DTE, and the return for NIS, the stock market index, uh, in Excel you just type slope and this uh, beta and open bracket. Uh, whenever you open bracket and click on function here, this screen pops up and you have the known y's and x's. And this is the regression equation where we calculate beta. The y is the stock return, the company's return, and x is the index return. You just need to highlight the numbers only without titles in both columns and you end up with beta. This is the 0.2. The, uh, the next step, as you see here, we have already calculated the stock beta and we have the US Treasury bill. This is what I, uh, I pointed at in the previous uh, slide. And now we can combine both of them in this model. This is the discount rate as said by William Sharp. Uh, when you work out these uh, numbers, the US Treasury uh, bill rate is this one. It's extracted from the previous slide. The stock beta is this one. This is what I did in the previous slide. And the stock market risk premium, as I said, it's equal to the average return on NIS, the stock market index, this one, minus the risk-free rate of return, which is this one. So when you worked out uh, manually, you end up with a kind of surprise that the price is negative. Of course, it's quite a funny result because the price of any stock is never negative. And this is to show you the limitation of using this model. Actually, this model works out under one condition and one condition only. This is what I just mentioned five minutes ago, that uh, the growth rate of a dividend has to be less than the required rate of return or the key. Now, when you look at uh, the, the growth rate, the growth rate is greater than uh, the required rate of return. Uh, the growth rate G is the dividend per share growth rate is 2%, but the required rate of return, I mean the treasury bill rate is 0 0.008, which is quite small, and the growth rate of dividend is quite high, and that's why we end up with this uh, uh, impractical result. A negative stock price. So the this model works out, as I said, under certain mathematical condition if the company doesn't pay uh, dividend at a growth rate greater than the interest rate. 
the uh, we have uh, another comment on this uh, result which is uh, uh, quite uh, practical because the any company in any stock market can actually uh, control the direction of uh, the stock price by using the dividend growth rate. If we assume that uh, the discount rate is set by the Federal Reserve, uh, most of the investors are using the risk-free if they like, I mean the risk-free rate of return. Uh, so the company is in control of two variables here. The first one is the current dividend, how much money the company pays to the investor, and the second one the growth rate, I mean the increases in quarterly dividend. If the company is able to control these two, value, two values, definitely the company will be in control of determining whether the stock will be trading as overvalued the stock or undervalued the stock. So if the company realizes that the stock has become overvalued, the company has to do it changes in the amount of dividend and the, the growth rate in order to take it very close to the market price. Uh, so this is the final result of what we call a constant perpetual growth model. Uh, I remind you again that uh, the term perpetual here doesn't mean at all that the stock or the company uh, would stay in the market forever. Um, and it doesn't mean at all, again, uh, that the investor would keep this stock forever. But uh, the perpetual means literally that the growth rate uh, is assumed to stay for indefinite time, even if this is one or two quarters. But if the investor doesn't have any idea whether the company will be changing them out of dividend or not. So it's quite practical that we assume that uh, the growth rate will stay uh, for a very long time. The uh, second condition, as I said, is that uh, the growth rate has to be less than the required rate of return. Otherwise, we end up with this mysterious uh, result. <coughs> so um, at the end, we have what we call it, uh, certain notes, observations about the constant perpetual growth model. Although it's quite simple to compute, but it's not, uh, first of all, it's not usable for the firm that do not pay dividends at all. If you can realize that the company doesn't pay any dividends, so you end up with a price equal to zero. The, the, the model uh, assumes that the company pays a uh, positive dividend and it's not even usable when the growth rate is greater than the required rate of return. And this is what I have been telling you a few minutes ago, that we, we just need to be very careful when using this model about the growth rate of dividend and the appropriate uh, discount rate. Is it going to be a risk-free rate of return as published by the Federal Reserve or a certain required rate of return as set by uh, the CAPM, Capital Asset Pricing Model. Uh, this is an acknowledgement about the K and G that they are really very difficult to estimate accurately. K changes maybe every day and it varies from one investor to another. The investor is risk free, uh, risk averse, will be using the uh, <coughs> the risk-free rate of return set by the Federal Reserve. If the investor is risk taker, definitely will not be using any rate of return on the money market, will be looking at many uh, other uh, different interest rates and other markets, uh, uh, rates of investment in the foreign exchange and real estate and banks, whatever. Uh, the G, as I said, is quite sensitive, again, because although it is estimated by the investor, but actually the amount of dividend is determined by the company. So uh, the company is in control of uh, uh, the growth rate of dividends. And this is the reason that I just mentioned that the company 
can use the amount of dividend, dividend per share, and the growth rate of dividend in order to control prices uh, in the stock market so the company can make any stock overvalued or undervalued quite easily. Uh, and that's why we end up with, uh, with this result that sometimes the perpetuity or the perpetual growth rate is, is often unrealistic because as I said, the perpetual here is, uh, is a metaphor. That doesn't mean that uh, the investor will be holding this stock forever, but it means literally that the investor doesn't have any investment horizon at all. So if the investment horizon is not determined, we assume perpetuity uh, yeah, under any circumstances. The investor has to have a certain time horizon, whether short term or long term. And even when it comes to short term, it varies from one investor to another. One investor might look at the one or two quarters as a short term. And another one might be looking at four quarters as short term. And the long term is the same. It ranges between three up to an uh, indefinite number of years. So the perpetuity here uh, it is, is equivalent to uh, the lack of determination that the investor is not able to determine the investment horizon. If the investor is able to determine the investment horizon, so we can use the first model because we have certain number of years and uh, the investor has to work out some expectation about the uh, stock price after one year, of two years, three years, whatever. And then we can use the present value equation, which I showed it to you at the beginning of this presentation. Uh, it's quite simple. The main target, as I said, of this method and the common methods is to determine what we call it the real price of the stock. But the determination of the real price is not, is not a target for itself. Uh, this is to determine whether the stock is overvalued and undervalued simply because investors in the stock market are uh, divided into two uh, types of investors or sometimes we refer to it as two styles of investment. One of them is called growth investing and the other one is value investing. Uh, the growth investing refers to the investors who invest in overvalued stock and the value investing refers to the investors who invest in undervalued stocks. So the main target here is that the investor needs to determine uh, the investment style whether he or she will be investing in overvalued stocks or undervalued stocks. So the right beginning is to calculate the real price of the stock. I repeat again, if the trading price of the stock is greater than the real price, it means uh, that the stock is overvalued, otherwise the stock is undervalued. And in this case, the investor can go for one stock according to his or her investment style. In a few minutes, uh, I'll tell you about the next approach for the stock valuation. Bye-bye.